Uh, for those of you who, uh, who know the Elwood family, uh, we have sent an announcement out on our email that um, on the 3rd of January, we're going to have a memorial service for Michael Elwood. Um, yeah, it will, uh, visitation from 4 to 5.30, and then at 5.30 we're going to do a memorial service for him. Uh, many of you might remember um, Barb and Russ uh, Elwood, and they will uh, be here. Um, and looking forward to just spending some time to bring them encouragement and comfort. Um, for those who are, who are planning to attend on the 3rd, um, the family has requested that um, you be vaccinated and masked for this reason. Uh, Barb is undergoing uh, treatment for uh, 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 chemotherapy treatment for cancer, and uh, so she's particularly vulnerable. And uh, so if you would just correspond to that vaccinated and masked, we would appreciate it, okay? All right, let's, uh, let's turn to the Word of God. Pray with me. Father, it is just so good when we hear from you. When we take some time, we open the scriptures, and there's your voice. And you're speaking to us, directing us in this particular day, at this particular time of our lives. It is a wonderful thing, Lord, that you do for us, speaking to us through your word. So we ask you this morning just to do that again. You're so faithful to us, God, and we're so appreciative of it. Speak to us through your word, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Pinterest is an interesting thing. I find that it um, both inspires and, and raises expectations. And then sometimes we find out that if we look toward the Pinterest, we might find ourselves not exactly making it the way we wanted to. Uh, for example, here's something that was on Pinterest, a great Christmas photo idea, right? Here's what happened when someone else tried it. <laughs> or perhaps this one, another Christmas photo. Beautiful, right? And here's the result. How about this one? Oh, aren't they sweet? Here's the result. <laughs> and of course, sometimes we like to include our animals. But here's what happened. <laughs> and for those of you who are thinking about Easter, Try this, but you might get this. <laughs> Sometimes we assume a photo or a bakery item is easily copied and reproduced, not recognizing the expertise and the equipment and the experience of the one whose work we are attempting to reproduce. And then we wonder why we really didn't nail it. If we knew what it took to reach the end that we envision, we might take more steps to prepare and to practice and to progress toward that desired outcome. Sometimes if we could see the end, we might alter the beginning or perhaps choose a different course altogether. The next time that we gather for worship, it'll be a new year. It'll be 2022. At the turn of the year, it seems natural to look ahead and behind and to consider making some changes. And often such changes relate to things like our health or to our finances, to how we'll spend our time in the coming year and with whom. And that's all good stuff to consider. Also, those of us who follow Jesus, we have this abiding awareness of a constant, I don't know, Holy Spirit urging to, to go deeper and to go higher in our devotion 
and in our obedience to Jesus. And a lot of times that's related to our worship, to the word of God, and, and to works of righteousness in our lives. So whether you're making changes regarding your health or your finances, your time and your relationships, and especially in dealing with matters of pursuing Jesus more, I urge you, from the beginning, see the end. Where do you want to be 52 weeks from now? Clarify that. Be exact. And then ask yourself, what will it really take to get there? How shall I start? Am I really ready to do this? What will I be doing, say, by the end of February, if I'm on this path? What's likely to throw me off? If this thing I'm pursuing, if I'm on track in, let's say, May, what's going to have to happen between now and then? How will I resist the temptation to take the summer off? By the time fall hits, where should I be by then? And with three months to go, maybe I should celebrate. What would that look like? And then how do I accelerate into those last 90 days? And all along, all year, what do I picture at the end? Will I be stronger, thinner, more swole, right? Or will I have some significant debt paid down? Some significant savings banked and invested? Maybe even a joyful grand amount given away? Maybe. Or the family. We could be tighter and, and bonded better. My spouse, secure and celebrated. My friendships, more deeply invested in. Or concerning things of the Lord, God's word more deeply in my mind and, and on my lips. God's love flowing more deeply in my heart and God's spirit. He's familiar and he's regularly challenging me. And his grace toward me is everywhere I look. You see, from the beginning, see the end. Keep it in mind. And that will keep you on track. It'll reignite you when you get weary and just distracted. And you will get both those things. Weary and distracted. It'll remind you that in this coming year, you are not just burning days. You're on a quest. You're on a journey. You're on a saga with a worthy and welcome end. And you could look at the end of 2022 and say, I nailed it. And it's evident how worthwhile all this is. And, and for Christians, it's, it's applied discipleship and, and just, just good stewardship. But using what I just said as a foundation, I want you to see that the Lord himself through his word, actually, actually is calling us to look at a much more important end than just December 31st, 2022. You might be surprised that Jesus spoke of this end that I'm talking about more than he spoke about worship or witnessing or immorality all of which were indeed concerns of his. The end I'm referring to is the end of your days on earth. Or depending on the timing, his return and the end of human history on earth. Now whether you're in the beginning 
of a relationship with Jesus, you've been at it for a while maybe, or even if your days happen to be short. Jesus wants all of us to live today seeing the end and letting that shape how we live tomorrow. And we're going to look at three passages in the Gospels in which Jesus teaches his followers to, from the beginning, see the end. And in particular, then, what sort of behavior that should produce while we await that end. An end, by the way, that is called in other places in the Scripture the blessed hope, the fullness of our salvation, it's called coming home. It's called being with the Lord forever. So, regarding this end that we're talking about, Jesus tells us first to watch. Turn to Mark chapter 13. We'll begin reading in verse 33. Jesus says, be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch. Because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. Now, honestly, honestly, how much of this occupies your thinking, what Jesus just talked about here. How often are you at all aware that you have a future appointment with Jesus face to face? Now, if you die before he returns, it'll occur when you close your eyes to this life and enter into his presence. That's when this will happen. If you happen to be alive upon Jesus' return, it'll happen then. But it is going to happen. Jesus refers in this parable to us as his servants, and we have assigned tasks while the master is away. And his return, while uncertain as to when, is absolutely certain as to if he is coming back. And the master's concern is that when he returns, when we see him face to face, we are not asleep. Three times in this passage, he says, watch. He says, be on guard. Now, our current excuse is that it's been two millennia since he promised his return, right? 2,000 years. So maybe, maybe this is all like a metaphor, or maybe we just don't really get what he's talking about here, but is it really that? Well, the apostle Peter didn't think so. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, Peter the apostle writes this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3. Get towards the back of your New Testament. He says this, starting in verse 3. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago 
by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed. But he goes down to verse 9 and he says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. What Peter is saying here is that our Savior does, he loves the idea of bringing us home. But he also loves showing mercy and saving sinners from lostness and death. Every day that passes is a day closer to that great day of his return. And every day that passes is also a testament to Jesus' great love for the lost. And that's our business as his servants, is it not? If we're watching, we're aware that we have someone who is coming Someone who loves us and someone who loves to save others. So he's saying, let's obey. Let's watch. Let's serve and not sleep through this life as if we have nothing of eternal worth doing until we get home. Let's watch. Let's keep an eye on the fact that this is all going to wind up someday or I'm going to wind up before that and live in that, see that end from the beginning. Second thing we see in the scriptures is while we await this end, we're called to be faithful in the house. Turn to Matthew chapter 24. Starting in verse 45. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them food at the proper time? It'll be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly I tell you, he'll put him in charge of all his possessions, but... Suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And in an hour that he's not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Here in this parable, Jesus describes a, a similar scene from the one before. A master is away for a prolonged time. But here, the management of his household is in view. A faithful and wise servant will take care of his fellow servants. Specifically, he says in this passage that he feeds them at the proper time. He feeds them. And because he does, does this faithfully, he's honored and rewarded by the master. That's how the parable begins. But then Jesus switches the dynamic, and the lead servant, after a prolonged absence by the master, he abuses his fellow servants, and he identifies with and, and relates to those who are, well, sinners. He sins with those outside the household. This servant has no expectation that he will ever be held account because he does not live in the expectation of the master ever really, really showing up. Now, since Jesus locates all of this in the household, that's what he's talking about here, where we're drawn to consider that here he's speaking about the church, the household of faith, that Jesus is establishing when he spoke these words. That's what he's got in mind. His servants 
together in this household that we call the church. What do we draw from this? If we're watching from the beginning and looking to the end, faithful churches will be led by faithful leaders who demonstrate their faithfulness by the way in which they feed the servants. Begs the question, but what, what feeds the church? What does Jesus have in mind here? What's he talking about? Well, Jesus himself said that he is the bread of life. John chapter 6. And the scriptures in other places in the New Testament are called spiritual food. Hebrews chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 2. And Jesus himself said, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So, he's talking about churches where the word of God is being feasted upon and fed. Apostate churches are led by faithless leaders who deny the authority of God's word and who lead others to sin alongside with those who never even pretend to be in the family of God. Many of these churches not only disavow the master's return, they deny he ever really lived. Until Jesus comes back, or till we see him face to face, this church here, West Springs, we're called to be faithful in the house. We will watch. We will see the end from the beginning. We will share and we will feast upon God's word. And then lastly, our life, each of our lives, which belongs to the master, if we have our eye on the end through the beginning, it'll be invested with the expectation to multiply. Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 14. This is Jesus speaking. He says again, it'll be like a man going on a journey. Similar theme. Who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one he gave five bags of gold, to the other two bags, and to another one bag each according to his ability. Then he went on a journey. The man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness the man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I've gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. The man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you are a hard man. Harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant, so you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed? Well, then you should have put the money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I'd have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has more will be given more. And whoever, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what they have will be taken from them and throw that worthless servant outside in the darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
So in this story, we have a master again who's going away for an indeterminate time. And what he gives, understand this, what he gives is his. It's, it's the master's. And he gives it in varying amounts to three of his servants. Now, the NIV has bags of gold. Uh, it's also called the talents. And from what we can tell, uh, each bag of gold was probably worth about half a million dollars in spendable money today. Essentially, this story compares what two of the servants did with what belongs to the master to what the third servant did. Now, some people interpret this talents, they kind of read the word abilities here, and they think this is all about, you know, using your talents. But, but notice in verse 15 that the amount of gold is given according to their abilities. So it's almost like he's giving this according to certain abilities or talents that the people have. So there must be something else in mind. Talents must represent something else than abilities because he's giving them according to abilities. Throughout the scripture, though, what each of us has been given in varying degrees and of which we must make an account isn't our talents, it's our life. We give an account for our life. All three servants still have what the master entrusted to them when he returns. The difference is what they did with it in the meantime. And in the case of the third, why he did what he did. So two of them invested their lives to multiply what the master had given them. To use the life the master had given them to extend life. And, and some servants, they have more than others. Some people have more opportunity. Some people have more freedom. Some people have more support. Some people have better health and better living conditions. But both of the faithful servants put their lives to work for the master. Investment then as it is now always involves risk. And so you must act wisely and have faith. And that type of life gains the master's approval and the outcome for you is what? Joy. Come enter your master's happiness. You take your life, whatever condition the life is that you have, you don't compare it to others. You simply take what you have and you seek to extend it, to multiply it, because it's the master's. And you want to give it back to him in that way. The third servant, well, he did not invest his life for the master. Oh, he has the life at the end, it's there. He just didn't use it. He buried his life in the ground. Why? Why did he? What does it say? It says he has a warped perspective that led to fear. What does he say? He says, Master, he said, I knew you were a hard man, so I was afraid. And the master in this story, while not disagreeing or agreeing with the servant's perspective, that, that's not the point. I imagine he says in some kind of Dwight Schrute voice, false. If you actually believed that about me, you'd have done something with your life. In reality, you chose to be wicked and lazy, which means that you aren't a servant at all, nor are you part of the household. My friends, if from the beginning we see the end, we will live with an eye open to the day that we will see the master. We will see him. That day is coming. And he's gone away for now. But soon he will return. And in this household that he calls the church, he calls us to live faithfully, building up our fellow servants, feeding and feasting on his word, and today, today, 
today, right now, and every day hereafter, investing his gift of life, this gift that he gave to us, investing it, living our lives to multiply life. What would the account look like today if today you found yourself face to face with Jesus saying to him here's the life you gave me and here's what I did with it that's the end that we see from the beginning and throughout this life till we see him face to face or at his return that's the end and we are called to watch guard to watch out Let's have the worship team come up. Pray with me. Father, as this day after Christmas reminds us of how faithful you are, how a promise given generations ago came to pass in a stable in Bethlehem and how that Savior Jesus saved us on a cross died in our place for our sins everything you promised he delivered and he promised that he would return and he promised that our lives matter that we live as servants, that we give an account, and that makes a difference. And his Holy Spirit equips us and enables us, Lord, to live the life that he calls us to. But he promised us that we will see him face to face. And because he loves us, he encouraged and warned us to be ready to give an account, to keep an eye on the end, so that we live in a life that will honor and praise him, that will be full of his word and seeking to multiply this life that he's given us by loving others and bringing the word into this dark world. We thank you, Lord, that as we come into a new year and make plans for changes that you've called us to, that we know now, Lord, to keep our eye on the end, right here at the beginning, and throughout our lives to do the same. And we say, along with the rest of the Scripture, come, Lord Jesus. And in your name we pray. Amen.